let's talk about feed lines and the type that's most suitable for your application. In a nutshell, the fatter and stiffer the coax, the lower the loss it is, and the more it will project your signal further and stronger. First thing I did was to go to the kv5r.com website where amongst other things it's got a coaxial cable loss calculator. So you can put in things like the type of cable, the length, the frequency, VSWR loss, etc. I was interested in lengths of cables for particular frequencies that had a loss of no more than 1 dB. 1 dB means that you keep 80% of your power, like you can see on the screen if you apply 100 watts. A 1 dB loss means that you're still getting 80 watts out at the antenna end. So I thought that was a good reference point for an acceptable level of cable loss. You probably wouldn't notice 1 dB, almost imperceptible if you were to listening to a signal on the air and they were to drop the power from say 5 watts to 4 watts. You'd hardly notice it but the thing is that losses do add so you might have losses in your coax feed line but there might be other losses in antenna matching and in the antenna itself so it's better to keep each stage of losses as low as you can make it. And different types of coaxial cable have different amounts of loss and the most suitable type depends on your frequency of operating and the length of cable and other factors like what installation you have and your budget. I put in lots of figures for frequency and lengths for different frequency bands and different types of cable and came up with the graph that you see here. This is basically the coax length or maximum coax length for 1 dB loss at various frequencies uh, which I've got on the Y axis going up from 3.5 to 1296 megahertz and then the length in meters across the bottom. So if you've got a really thin coax like RG174 you wouldn't use this at home but some QRP portable operators might use it if they want a very light package feed line for their antenna. Although personally I use a lot of N-fed wire antennas and they don't require much of a feed line. But anyway, if you are using small dipoles and you do need a feed line, then RG174 can be okay. However, it depends on the frequency and the length. Like if you look at the line there, if you were happy with um, 1 dB loss, which is what the line means, then you could have maybe 5 metres of it, and that would give you acceptably low loss on 28 megahertz and all frequencies below it. So it would be fine for HF. Whereas if you were to use that same length on 432 megahertz, uh, 5 metres, then you would be losing a lot of your power, in fact most of your power. So I wouldn't recommend RG174 at all for the higher frequencies and in the VHF range. But 28 megahertz and below for say five meters is okay. If you're only concerned about even lower HF bands like seven megahertz, then even a 10 or 12 meter length would be fine for RG174. Um, looking at more a mobile installation, RG58 is very common. It's also common for some home installations. If you aren't able to put a very big hole from the outside to the inside, then RG58 is a bit thinner and cheaper than other types of coax, so you might be using that. That is acceptable on HF for lengths if your antenna at home is not very high. Uh, like if it's if you only need 20 meters of cable, then RG58 would be okay for you know, 14 megahertz and downwards. Uh, it, losses do mount up at 28 megahertz, so I would suggest another feed line if you're going to be using 20 meters of it 
uh, for 28 megahertz. But if you've only got 10 meters from the middle of your antenna to your transceiver, then RG58 is fine on all bands from you know 28 megahertz down, uh, less than one dB of loss. Um, RG213 is thicker than RG58, requires different coaxial connectors, PL259s, um, and that's got much less loss again. Actually, something I should mention is the relationship between frequency and loss. Very roughly, if you triple the frequency, you double the loss. For instance, compare 7 and 21 megahertz. If you take a given length of cable for, uh, let's say, RG58 for 7 megahertz, then it might, might be 27, 28 meters. That's about the point where your loss gets to 1 dB. But if you look at 21 megahertz, then it's half that, around 14, 15 meters. So very roughly, if you triple the frequency, you double the loss, and thus the length for your 1 dB threshold is halved. And if you look at the VHF bands, they're roughly three times each other, 50 to 144, 432, 1296. A similar story there. Uh, you're doubling the loss when you go from 144 to 432, and that halves the acceptable length. And as for other frequencies, well, when we look at long cable runs, like some people have very long distances from their antennas to their radio shack, that can be a good idea if they are running high power, or they're on a farm and they've got a bit of land in the centre of their tower, or dipole or beam is some distance from the shack and it's also a good idea to have antennas away from the house if your shack is in the house so that you don't have domestic appliances causing interference but that requires a long length of feed line and with a longer length of feed line comes more loss so even on HF you do need to be a bit aware of the limitations of even RG213 like at 28 megahertz, it's around 25 meters, it's okay, but if your length of coax feed line is longer than that, like say 50 meters, then RG213 really isn't a very good choice. And as a rule of thumb, the lower loss coax tends to be either thicker or stiffer, bulkier, and a little bit less easy to work with, but you do get rewards with the lower loss, which can be a benefit when you've got the longer lengths. So for say 50 meters on 28 megahertz, then you'd be looking at your better quality types of coax. Um, shorter lengths on VHF, again for medium type lengths on VHF, again, you'd be looking at your better quality of coax. Uh, you could use RG58 for very short lengths, um, like to a ground plane that will work with the repeaters on two meters. That's perfectly fine for a length of say um, Five meters 10 meters length would have more loss But you'll again be able to get into the repeaters. Okay, um, unless signals are very marginal Then you've got stuff like your Heliax your LDF 450. That's really low loss. So for bands like 432 meg or 1296, unless your transceiver is right at the antenna, then yeah, definitely use the better type of coax for the higher VHF frequency ranges, and especially into UHF. An interesting thing if you look at the top line is 450 ohm ladder line. Uh, ladder line, an open wire feed line, actually has a lot less loss than the coaxial cable so that is a possibility you do have an issue though with potential impedance matching because most of your commercially made transceivers amplifiers and antennas are rated at 50 ohm which suits the coaxial cable we're interested in but not the ladder line so you'll need some way of transforming impedance by nine to one so 
basically stay below the line if you want to keep the loss to below 1 dB and you'll get out well and your station will be as efficient as it can be. Um, now I assumed before the VSWR was 1.5 to 1 or better however if the VSWR increases a bit then the loss also increases but if you stick to the 1 dB rule of not allowing feed line loss any more than 1 dB. Even if you were to bump the VSWR up to 3 to 1, uh, which is quite a big impedance mismatch, then your extra loss is about 0.5 of a dB. So, not perfect, but it is acceptable. So, add that to your coax loss and you're up to about 1.5 decibels, or about 28% of your power. Um, and that could be a benefit if you're using antennas that have a narrower bandwidth than the band that you're operating in, like a 28 or 50 megahertz beam will possibly not cover the entire band. Your VSWR might be, say, 3 to 1 near the band edges. Then you could use an antenna coupler, even if it's at the transceiver end, and address any minor mismatches, even if the VSWR is 3 to 1, and you should be okay. Uh, a small amount of extra loss, but as we're not starting with much loss, we're sticking to within 1 dB, the extra half dB is probably acceptable. One thing you're seeing right now on the screen is a 15 element Yagi. Um, for 2 meters. Um, that's got a specified gain of nearly 17 dB. And it's quite a monster. It's nine, nearly 10 meters long. So it's a big boom and it's more than your average tower to support it. And if you have a look on, on the right, on the right is the reflector and the driven element. And if you work from the right then let's say that you've got just your six elements. Six elements will give you about 10 dB of gain. And a six element beam on two meters might have a boom length of only two meters, so it's quite easy to put up. You don't need a very strong mast, you don't need guy wires, and even a light duty rotator would be okay for that. But as you increase the gain, you can see how the elements when you go from right to left get further and further apart so you've doubled the boom length just by adding a few elements and then you double it again to get gain and this is a case where you almost reach a point of diminishing returns if you're to increase the gain by an extra db on an antenna that's already high gain, like what you're seeing there, then you need to increase the boom length quite dramatically. And that can become mechanically quite difficult. It puts extra stress on your mast. It might be overhanging a neighbor's yard, which you might not want. And you might need a stronger boom and more supports, all these sorts of things. So you have to think there about the trade-off. Okay. Um, if you don't want to go to the extra trouble and expense of adding extra elements on a beam, then maybe a lower loss feed line might be a more cost effective way of getting the same benefit. And bearing in mind that just like adding extra elements onto the antenna, you're getting the benefit on both transmit and receive. So it's a bit of juggling there with whether you add more elements or whether you get a better feed line. But for weak signal type work like moon bounce, 1 dB is significant. So yes, it might be worth paying some extra money for better feed line. Maybe your threshold might be half a dB and not 1 dB. But generally speaking, especially for HF and for less critical purposes, 1 dB is a reasonable threshold. Um, and stay below 1 dB and you'll have a good performing station. There's other things with coaxial cable as well, uh, like the power handling capacity. Generally speaking, thicker the cable, the more power it can handle. RG174, you wouldn't be putting any more than QRP through. RG58, it'd be okay with 20 or 30 watts, possibly 100 watts. 
you wouldn't be putting um, you know, some countries, you know, allow amateurs to run, you know, a kilowatt. You wouldn't be running a kilowatt through that. You'd be going for your thicker types of cable for that. Um, but the main thing with coax cable is the loss, keeping below it. And when you keep below it, then you'll have the best possible signal from your station. Enjoy these videos? Want to start in amateur radio? Well, check out my books, Ham Radio Get Started for USA readers and the Australian Ham Radio Handbook for those in Australia. For more information, visit my website, vk3ye.com, or search their titles on Amazon.